I'm Anna Brafe, as I said, I'm the president and co-founder of Cherish. If you don't know who we are, um, we're actually a portfolio of brands. Um, our oldest and biggest is Cherish, which is a destination uh, for vintage and one-of-a-kind finds. Um, in January, we acquired Daring Hall, which is a discovery platform for high-end contemporary and new and custom pieces. And then we have a third site called Decasso, which is sort of a best of the best edit across those two brands all in one place. And we love interior designers, so I'm super excited to be here today. Um, Julia asked me to come speak about the future of shopping. And so I'm going to walk through um, a couple things. Um, first off, industry trends. I'm going to be talking about home furnishings as a category. How many are we selling? Where are we selling? What's growing? What's not? Um, and why. Then I'm going to um, be sharing with you some proprietary information. We have about 25,000 interior designers registered with us. We just completed a proprietary study with them where we had 2,000 interior designers' responses. And so I'm going to be talking with you today about what we learned from, from you guys. And then lastly, because I know I'm in a room with people who love beautiful things, as I do, I'm going to be talking about product trends and what we're seeing is selling, particularly amongst the interior design community. So a lot to cover, so I'm going to get into it quickly. The big news, actually, Julia started off by sharing this morning, which is home goods is now the fastest growing e-commerce category in the US. So all these folks you see up here talking about venture investment, entrepreneurship, and innovation. This is really why, for most American households, home furnishings is their third largest spend over the course of their lifetime, if you can believe it, after the house itself and then cars. So the idea that um, this category is now starting to move so disruptively online is a huge business opportunity and creating a lot of interest. One way of looking at it is um, this way. So this is online share of the US home market. So as you can see, 16% of home goods sales happened in 2016 online, and that's grown by 42% in just two years to almost 23%. Um, and if you like me and you started off in this business, we started Cherish six years ago, there were really questions back then as to whether or not will people buy furniture online. Brands were asking that question. Designers were asking that question. My parents were asking that question when I told them I was going to start this business. And um, clearly the answer now is yes. Um, one of the things to look at is this is the total home category. And by the way, I'm pulling this from a study from Internet Retailer. Um, the business is now about a $240 billion business. Um, and when you look at it, it's grown 3.4% in the past year. And 94% of that growth has come from the online space. So just another way of underscoring how the online environment and channel is really shaking up this industry and building on the growth. It might seem clear to many people why, but I just wanted to stop and talk about it. Really the reason why we think technology is so powerful in this industry is rooted first and foremost in choice. So when you think about, and this is something we think about at Cherish every day, someone coming to buy a piece of furniture, how many factors go into making that piece the right match for that buyer? So you have size, you have style, you have price, color, material, depth, I mean, all of, the, all of the things you can imagine. And the idea of being able to solve all those problems and create all that matchmaking within the confines of a brick-and-mortar store or even a collection of brick-and-mortar stores is really, really hard. Um, and so many people leave not finding exactly what they need. The endless aisle of the Internet is really helpful to help create those matches. And what that means is convenience. So when you add all of those choices together with great filtering, great search, search by arm height, search by, you know, velvet, whatever color you're looking for, style, that starts to become a much faster and much more useful shopping experience. And then you get to the value of really what we're seeing with the online space. And that's um, quite a powerful combination. Pretty much any business study you'll read about disrupting marketplaces, these three factors have to come together, and then you start to see explosive um, growth and changes. Um, one really interesting thing, um, I should mention my husband, who's my co-founder, comes from the travel business. And when he was part of the whole movement from people standing in line to buy tickets, which if you can believe it, we used to do, um, to actually buying you know, airline tickets online, obviously it's a 100% move to the online space. That's uh, not going to happen in this category. And one of the things that we've been observing is really what this buying pattern is starting to look like. So um, much of the process starts actually on the phone. 
which I think is interesting, and I'll talk about why in a second. But people really are doing their research first on mobile, and they're, they're narrowing things down to start to understand what the range of choices are. Then what we see is where possible people will go into store to confirm and actually see the product in real life and start to discover it and make sure that it's, it, it's going to be the right fit for them. And then we're seeing them go back online to actually buy it. Um, so that's sort of an interesting process and why, unlike uh, airline tickets, this won't be a 100% channel shift, obviously. Um, and the role of the store and brick and mortar is actually playing a really important role. Um, one thing I wanted to comment on before I move on is just millennials. There's been a lot of talk about millennials, particularly with the direct-to-consumer brands. Um, millennials now make most of their purchases online. By the way, this information is not specific to the furniture category, it's just in general. They make most of their pur purchases online, and what's so interesting is, is that mobile is really growing and desktop is, is going away. So as everyone's thinking about how to present their products online, this is a really important thing to note, is designing for a small screen, shooting product for a small screen, and starting to think about that. Um, the next part I'm going to talk about are designers. One thing I've observed, having been in this business for a bit, has been when we talk with people who work at the higher end of the category with um, more luxury level products and with the interior design community, when they're presented with information about the digital world, they'll say, oh yeah, that's true for everybody else and at the mass levels, but not necessarily true for the design professional community and the quality of product that I'm selling. And I really wanted to just start to dispel that myth um, with our study that we're getting through. Um, so here's what we heard designers are saying. First off, I wanted to talk about why designers are important. So I mentioned it's a $240 billion category. And this is from the ASID State of the um, Industry report that just came out. And it shows that designers are actually responsible for $80 billion, so 30% of the spending in the category. We size the interior design professional market to be anywhere from 60 to 80,000 people. So when you think about 60 to 80,000 people driving $80 billion worth of spending, you can see why Julia probably didn't have a hard time getting sponsors for this event, because, <laughs> because it's a really influential group driving a ton of spending. Um, and just to give you a sense of who, who our respondents were, um, our average designer who was responding in our survey, and I mentioned there were 2,000 of them, is 52. She's had 18 years in the industry. Her project sizes are about, th her budgets are about $300,000, seven employees, and she does 15 projects a year. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really practicing um, and, and busy designer who we heard back from. What do we hear? 84% um, of them are starting their sourcing online. So it's the first place they go to narrow down their choices and to start to put products on their short list for purchasing and specifying. Two, 81% will end up buying those items after having first viewed them online. So online as the starting place is a really, really compelling and important part of um, the sales cycle. Three, 47% of all projects in an interior design project end up actually getting bought, so the buy button happens online. Um, and 54% of designers are using an online interface of some sort to begin to customize product. So it's really, I think, an important point is to all of us who are selling and wanting to service the interior design community to recognize that making this easy for designers and helping them be efficient in this is key to the success of our whole ecosystem. Um, this was one of my favorite quotes that came out of the study. Let's see if we can get that. 54% of interior designers say that their biggest professional challenge is a meddling client. I feel like I'm in Scooby-Doo when I say that. Um, if that hadn't been for those rascally kids. Um, so 54% <laughs> of designers say this is a challenge. And this is probably the biggest thing that I hear from designers is this notion that my customer is so exposed on Instagram and Pinterest to ideas and things that are out there. It's really a challenge for me to stay ahead and to really maintain my authoritative position as a design expert and demonstrate my value to the client. And so that's something we think about every day, which is how can we help designers really stay ahead of their client and, and to bring value to that relationship. Um, this is a quote I like, I consistently need to delight my customers with something new because they've seen, they've seen so much already by the time 
um, they start working together. What came out from, in terms of what designers need and what they were looking for were um, four main things. New and inspiring resources. So this is, again, the idea of staying ahead. We've all seen the, room, the rooms that have been Instagrammed and pinned and shared over and over and over again. So how can I surprise and delight my client with maybe a new maker or a new line or a new resource that hasn't been super exposed yet? Net pricing. If you're starting, you're 80, 4%, I think I said, of interior designers are starting their sourcing process online. Doing that without visibility into pricing is really onerous. So having that pricing visible online, but to designers only. Third is easy purchasing. Um, like everybody else, designers like to make this part simple, as well as tracking visibility. And lastly are digital tools. So how can I just spend less time on administration? Um, and so one of the things that um, I was talking about with Julia is, you know, how can brands who are interested in selling to designers respond? And I'm going to share with you some things that we're doing. They're not all our ideas first, and there's other brands doing these as well. Um, and I wouldn't say that we have all the answers, but here's some things that we're starting to do. We started off our business in the one-of-a-kind space. So by definition, we're bringing people things that you can't just find anywhere. Um, but this also extends into, for example, in Daring Hall, where we're doing work helping. Not everybody goes to High Point. Not everybody has a great design center right next to them where they can go in and see a floor set of what's new from a specific brand. So starting to bring those stories and those new products to life for designers, I think, is a really important thing. And it helps to give them the materials to really make their projects stand out and personalize to the client. Secondly is net pricing. So net pricing. Uh, we are really rigorous about checking designers' credentials before we allow them into our trade program. I mentioned we have 25,000. Um, so once they're in, they have a very different experience on our site than really anyone else and see pricing that's differentiated and service that's differentiated, with all which I'll talk about in a second. But also, we now have a rewards program as well, which is $75, $75 for every $5,000 spent on the site. Again, it's just a nice way of thanking the designer for their continued business and working with us. Um, Trade-only priority service. So we recognize that when designers work with us and really work with anybody, they're putting their business reputation on the line based on our service. Um, we have great customer service but we provide even better customer service for designers. So dedicated uh, phone support, dedicated email that gets answered 24 hours a day, uh, live chat on the site. So literally while you're shopping, if you have questions just for the trade, we have a team of specially trained staff just to answer those kinds of questions. And we're also experimenting with some new features around Trade Plus that allow people to have extended return windows to give them more flexibility with their clients when they get um, an item to make sure that it's the right fit. And lastly, digital tools, so project management. How do you organize things? How do you share them across your office? How do you share them with your client? These are all new features that we're launching and continuing to improve upon. Much of this just launched on Thursday. Net pricing we've done for a while. Um, so that's a little bit about what we're seeing happening in the actual industry and how we're trying to respond to it. One of the really interesting things from a product standpoint about our sites is we have, across all three platforms, over 500,000 one-of-a-kind products available. Each product is specially tagged when it arrives by style, color, material, maker, price, um, geography, all kinds of what we call structured data. And then we have 2.5 million shoppers come to our site a month. So when you take all that data around product and you link that with all those shoppers, you actually get some pretty interesting trend information. Um, so that's what I'm going to share with you a little bit next. Um, and this is specifically trend information that we used looking at what designer shopping patterns were and designer buying patterns and favoriting and uh, printing of tear sheet patterns showed us um, and what kind of the products that they were looking at all had in common. Um, so one of the most important trends, and this is sort of a meta trend, has just been the return to tr traditional. If I were standing on this stage even two years ago, I would have been talking about mid-century modern, um, and, rich, and which is still a very strong category for us, by the way. But particularly amongst designers, we're seeing a lot of return uh, to more traditional pieces, and that goes anywhere from in seating to lighting to tabletop and cabinetry. Um, coincidentally, I'm also going to show you a few of our best performing Instagrams um, that kind of pay this off. And once we saw these trends and we started to see where 
uh, what Instagram uh, images in particular were performing for us, they were remarkably correlated. So these are some examples from Alyssa Bovino and, and some other designers. Um, Dinah Ban Banman on the left, who um, that's from the San Francisco show house, actually. Um, coming up after that, pop art. So total counterpoint to return to traditional, but we're seeing tons and tons of interest, particularly amongst designers in pop art, perhaps because it's a graphic and very much a counterpoint to the traditional um, looks that we're seeing selling in furniture. But this has been a really important and growing category for us, and the brighter and the bigger, the better. Um, so here's some examples. On the left is another trend that we're seeing, which is three-dimensional pieces on the wall have just been bananas for us. Um, and here's some other examples that you'll see of big, um, bold, unafraid pop art pieces that are happening. Um, trims and fringe, again, this uh, we see particularly amongst designers, not just in traditional pieces, but also in contemporary pieces. It's just sort of a, a, a more, um, it's like there's just a lot of sense of flourish and love for this kind of richness right now that we're noticing. Um, and here you'll start to see it on some of our most liked Instagrams. And... Oh. Um, color predictions. So this is always interesting. I know that color is always a little controversial. Lots of people make predictions around color. Paprika has been a fantastic seller for us. It's kind of coming across a little brighter orange on the screen, but it's really more of a rich rust that we're seeing doing really, really well. It's almost a little bit richer than the traditional Hermes orange. Um, and you see that especially in um, contemporary pieces. It has been going really well. Um, and lastly, golden yellow. And I think it's because people are in the mood for some good news and cheeriness. <laughs> and yellow has been really taking off for us. And pretty much anything yellow we can't keep in stock right now. And you see some examples of that there. And there we go. So.